think about that. Think about if there's a part that either takes 18 hours to run and you only sure. have one of them. Or think about how many times it was a, a game of, okay, let's try a speed and feed. Let's try a speed feed depth of cut. Let's try these different things before we were able to fine tune it. Mathematically, based on how valuable time is alone, how much money are, is a customer saving oh, it's huge. by being able to utilize a system like this? It's mind blowing to me. You know, sometimes at MTD CNC, we get the best of the best of the best on camera. And that is my friend Chris. And we're going to walk and talk because there is something really fascinating and incredible going on at Akuma right now, today. There are hundreds of people learning about this technology or just kind of revisiting the technology and what's going on. Now, automation is kind of important and you have a lot of automation going on here at Akuma. So can we start with automation and as we walk through maybe pinpoint some of the areas where we see the most benefits? Absolutely. Uh, we feel like it's very important for automation to be front and center nowadays. People are struggling more and more to find qualified workforce and people that want to come back to work after COVID. So we still have a need for parts so we're attempting to help customers make it their life easier and uh, be able to automate things uh, with less work on their end and more work on our end, basically. Do you believe, Chris, in the three Ds, the dull, dirty, dangerous? So for those of us who are watching right now who still believe that robots, cobots, pallet change, bar feed, automation in general is taking jobs, it's removing the dull, dirty, dangerous, monotonous, these things, right? And it's, like you said, we have a labor shortage, so let's implement, let's embrace automation as a whole. Sure, it's, I don't feel like it's taking jobs, it's just shifting the jobs. Exactly. Right? So the repetitive tasks that maybe were a little more dangerous before, more dirty, like you said, people don't typically want those jobs, so let's automate the simple tasks like that. Maybe now it's a more high value added job where people are the robot programmers or the people doing more of the technical work and letting the robot do the redundant work. Yeah, so speaking of a couple of robots, we're now kind of in the middle of this main first area and we have, I see a couple of gantries here and a twin turret system. I see a grinding cell here with a nice FANUC robot and I see a wall of tombstones feeding two machines. Can we quickly go over each of these three pieces before we move on to the next section? Absolutely, so our 2SP2500, this is a twin spindle horizontal lathe. We have dual robot gantry arms on each side, 16 station stalkers. So for the more high volume type parts that parts just need to run, you don't need to attend them constantly with an operator. These things just go on and on and on. So a lot of automotive companies use these type of things. Um, you can do op 10, op 20, you can do op 10 coming out of either side. So either way you want to cut it up, basically it just keeps running. And it is for that high productivity and that makes sense because some of us are being able to do that. You mentioned automotive already, it makes perfect sense. But some of us are diving into the high mix, low volume as well. Sure. But before we even get to that, which is going to be on this wall right behind <laughs> you, let's talk about the grinding cell because I would make the discussion that oftentimes people in the grinding world are really used to manually loading and unloading. And so getting them into automation is a conversation these days. Sure, grinding is probably the, the least common of the three between turning centers and machining centers and grinders, obviously. Uh, more people have historically hand-loaded these things. They're the finished operation. Your parts already have a lot of money and time in them. They don't want to take any chances, so they want an operator to actually load these things. But with something like the load and go like we have here, very simple automation, very easy to set up, easy to teach. Basically park it in front of any machine, very accurate. You can load parts no problem and just let it grind for days. You know, it's funny, Chris. I uh, did a video with your team on this, and I said, you want to know how easy the load and go is? Watch this. We don't even need to have a conversation about it. I just walked off camera, right? Nice. All right, so we have, and I know this has a really fun name to it, but we have a huge cell here. I believe it's 27 different pallets feeding two different machines that can be utilized for 27 different jobs, a whole bunch of jobs on one tombstone, 27 of the same jobs. There's just so much flexibility and use to this. Would you like to elaborate? Sure, so this is the Daifuku cell. Daifuku, it's, that's the name. Yep, it's tied to two MB5000 horizontal machines centers and people see something like this and they automatically think they need high volume to fill this thing up well that's kind of opposite of what you really need um, because there's so many different pallets you can configure this thing any way you want to and every pallet can have its own job you can use it during the day to do all your setups and just let your production run during the evening so instead of having to have a second or third shift use your high value operators and setup guys during the day prove out a part on each pallet get all your stuff set up and just let it run all night 
Well, Chris, as we move on to this next area over here, I see a smaller machine, and Akuma has their own interface system, but a lot of people are familiar with other types of interfaces, and so this is kind of what we're showcasing over here. But before we get there, on the walk there, do you think you and I could maybe start a machine shop and uh, implement some of this Akuma strategy we're talking about right now? Absolutely. We yeah. got lots of them in stock. How many do you want to buy? Oh, I think we can work it out. I tell you what, we'll do the sales to get the jobs in. We'll use the Akuma machines. We'll start a garage. But now let's talk about this. So we went from the largest setup with the 27 pallets to what would be considerably one of the smaller ones. Can we talk about what we're looking at here? Sure, so this is a cell that Fanuc brought in. Uh, we work with multiple different robot manufacturers, Fanuc being one of them. So this is their Cobot. So historically, a robot is a larger, more industrial piece of equipment, right? It needs a little more safety around it uh, because it can be very dangerous, right? But a Cobot is meant to be more interactive, if you will, with the operator. So typically you see them in green or have some kind of green stripe on them. That means they're more user friendly. The torque motors inside won't be as aggressive. So if it does bump into you, it'll stop instantly. And this nice little cart set up here, basically you can run it in front of any machine, pull it up, teach a few points, park it right there, and just use it as an operator. Yeah, Chris, let's keep walking because as we walk, I have a couple of fun conversations. A, well, the, the cell that you had on the grinding machine over there, that was more of the robot. It was strapped off, protected. That's right. But, you know, we always have smart Alex from time to time when we talk about cobots to go, yeah, it's safe until you're polishing knives or something <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> and, yes, it's meant to be that way, and it is user-friendly in that way. But we always have those funny guys, don't sure. we? Sure, oh, yeah. It's, uh, it is what you make it, right? It's Anything can be dangerous no matter what you're doing, so you just got to be mindful of what you're doing, use it for what it's intended for, and you should be good. Yeah, and even our camera guy could trip up, and that could be dangerous <laughs> right, right now as he's yep. walking backwards yep. for us. So we're looking at a fast Tim cell. Now, I was spent some time with you guys at IMTS, and this fast Tim cell was connected to another machine, but That's what right. you wanted to focus on here was just kind of showing how it looks separated and that it can be implemented into multiple situations. Would you like to talk about that some? Sure, so we did have this at IMTS on an MB5000. Uh, the way this setup works, basically, for those that are limited on floor space, right, but don't have any vertical challenges, now we have a little horseshoe of six pallets, but we are three rows high. So now we can, depending on your pallet height, depends on how you configure it, it's very modular, so you can have two rows, one row, three rows inside there, whatever you want to do. Um, very similar to the Daifuku cell in the fact that I would use my machine tool during the day to do all my setups, get everything ready to run, let this thing run in the evening. It has a very smart cell controller uh, that basically, depending on what programs and tools you have in the machine, it can make decisions for you on what to run next. It can also go off your scheduling software and based on due dates decide what you need to run next. So it has a lot of intelligence built in so you take some of that need away from your shop floor guys let them focus on what they do best, making parts, and let the cell kind of make the decisions. You know, I'm starting to hear pieces of this conversation, Chris, that to someone like you and I might sound like common sense, but they, they, they're being repeated and I think purposely repeated. Let your high quality guys, your high paid guys, you guys have been doing it a while, a couple of things. One, let them do the setups and get everything going and allow it to run through the night profiting and making money. Right. But two, allowing them to get back to the things that they love. Sure. The reason they got into the business, the creative side of things, creating that profitability that all the companies want anyway, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's why it's a little bit harder to find people to run nonstop production, right? Because it's monotonous. It can be boring at times. Some people love it, but most people want to kind of create works of art out of metal. That's why we got into this trade. So making one or two of anything and then turn it over to an operator or in this case, an automated sale to make the rest of the parts while you go on to the next thing, that's where the fun is. I tell you what, I'm glad I brought you on camera and I wasn't joking when I said best of the best of the best. That's what Chris is here for. Now we have a horizontal machine over here and a lot of times the cell we were just looking at would be connected to something like this. We purposely separated it and although this one isn't specifically talking about automation, let's talk a little bit about horizontal machining, the coolant flush, the chip flush, the longer tool life, better finishes that come from the possibility of utilizing a horizontal machine correctly, plus a little bit of automation of having tombstones on either side that allow you to run through the night. Sure, because the spindle is horizontal instead of vertical, like on a traditional machining center when most people think of it, uh, chip evacuation is now not a problem because gravity's your friend, basically. So we put a bunch of different chip flushes in there. Gravity takes the chips down. We make sure we flush all that out. So on a vertical, your chips just stack up on your table, right? So to automate that becomes a lot more difficult because you have to have that clean before you put your next pallet or your next part in, where we don't have that same problem here. 
and this is a two APC, meaning a two pallet changer has two pallets, so you can load parts outside the environment while the machine is cutting parts inside. So it's kind of the simplest form of automation where it doesn't have 27 pallets that's gonna run all night, but your operator or whoever can be loading parts while the machine is still running in cycle. There's really no downtime other than the actual pallet swap. So it's still automated, if you will, where the spindle uptime is much, much higher than it would be on a vertical. Yeah, and I've seen similar situations to this where the setup time and the run time are actually equivalent. So by removing the setup time completely, well, you know what that does to the overall Absolutely, cycle time sure. is cut it in half. Really great explanation. Um, we've seen those fans that blow off chips yep. on, the, on the other style machines. We've seen uh, air blasts and coolant blasts, but I really like the horizontal machining for everything you mentioned, but also we can get multiple sides on multiple parts and turn sure. that tombstone, right? That's right, the B-axis, yep. uh, a traditional tombstone has either two or four sides, but you can basically do anything you want to do in there. It depends on what size of parts you have, what your work holding looks like, all that sort of thing. So your imagination is a limiting factor, basically, when it comes to this stuff. Which is something you do not lack, is imagination. <laughs> that is for sure. Now, we're over on, now this is another big sell. And I was talking with one of your colleagues. If you've not seen that video yet for the audience watching right now, you must. And I gotta see if we can open this, Chris, or if it's in another area. It actually is. So we're gonna see if we can slide over here. Um, what the focus was in this part of the conversation is obviously able to be automated in a similar sense to that tombstone we just discussed yep. where one's being set up while the other one's being run, except something about the software and the connectivity allows for a customer to know the finish or get their best finish on a part, even if it's a one-off based on this new technology. Sure. Can we describe what's going on with that? Absolutely, so we have a product called Surface Guide. So basically we take our CAM software output, we run it through Surface Guide, that will show us imperfections and irregularities in the toolpath. We have something called Hypersurface, which is our software that makes intelligent decisions on the toolpath itself. And basically that allows imperfections to be kind of pulled out of that toolpath so any little inconsistency in the model or in the machine itself, it'll help smooth it so you have a better, more consistent surface finish. You know, you should have told me to sit down before I got that answer, because good grief, are you... I mean, think about that. Think about if there's a part that either takes 18 hours to run and you only yeah. have one of them. Or think about how many times it was a, a game of, okay, let's try a speed and feed. Let's try a speed feed depth of cut. Let's try these different things before we were able to fine tune it. Mathematically, based on how valuable time is alone, how much money are, is a customer saving oh, it's huge. by being able to utilize a system like this? It's mind blowing to me. Absolutely. I mean, your CAM software will do a great job and simulation software also does a great job, but it only does so well and the machine is going to be as accurate as it can to try and hit your toolpath points. So this software helps us with that color map you see over there on the TV. Mm -hmm. It helps us understand where maybe any divots are, any irregularities, and we use the software on board the control to try and help pull some of that stuff out to make a better part right out of the box. I like that you finished with that. Now we're going to try and sneak in if our camera guy can follow us and the part is over here, which I believe it is. I think this is a great way to finish, Chris, because everything we just described is sitting right here for our cameraman to show, yep. where it shows rough, rough, semi-finish, finish, and finish. And that was purposely done to show the differences between maybe a standard machining process where you have to try and fine tune it to what you can do on the one off on the first try, right? Absolutely, we've done this with different CAM softwares. So basically we take the same part, program it in different CAM softwares, which they all give a little bit different output. So we've compared it this way, we compare different settings. So the, the rougher or more coarse the settings, the faster you can go, because we're not trying to hit the points as accurately. So maybe for the roughing, we go a little bit faster with a little bit looser tolerances. And the finishing, we tighten that up a little bit. So without having to make any real changes, we can go through Surface Guide, see exactly what we're gonna get here on the screen. It matches up basically one for one. So if you see a dimple on the screen, you're gonna see it in here. Absolutely perfect way to close this. My friends, thank you all for watching. Chris, you are incredible. Thank you for making time. One of the busiest guys here at Akuma. So this is a special occasion. Thank you all for watching. Chris, one more time, my friend. That was an awesome thank tour. You. Thank you Appreciate so much. It.